Okay, everybody, what's going on? She got Dollar Bill score right here on the back and forth. I got something that's going to really trip y'all out, okay? This story took place almost 20 years ago, uh, February 20th, 2003, to be exact. The story is about the station nightclub fire. There was an 80s uh, band there, Great White, headed up by Jack Russell. And they were scheduled to perform. And when they got to do their set, like first few seconds into their set, they set off their pyrotechnic um, fireworks or special effects. And moments later, everything changed. This story has literally rocked America. I believe this went down as one of the most tragic club fires in American history. So I'm not going to do a lot of talking. I'm going to show you, first of all, a news clip and then a little small um, piece about the clip. And then I'll actually show you the footage from what happened that night. There was a reporter there. The story goes that one of the owners of this club also was a news reporter for the local station. And what they were doing this night was filming in this guy's club because the topic was about club safety because they were bouncing off what happened with the Club E2 tragedy in Chicago where the people got trampled and so they were going to say, so they were saying that, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to do a piece on club safety. And the guy who's a reporter who owns the station nightclub said, hey, and guess what? You can use my club to do the news piece on. So the actual footage I'm going to show you is from the news station and the videographer that night. And it's the actual footage from start to finish of this tragedy over 100 people lost their lives it changed club fire safety and codes all across america as you can see on the bottom right you can see one of the victims this man was burned 45 to almost half of his body he lost his left eye he lost his ears he lost his fingers, his hair, that guy was, it said on record, he was, uh, out of all the survivors, he was the one that had the worst uh, done to him in the fire. So out of all survivors, he had the worst that happened to him. Now imagine this. You're out at a nightclub, you're out with some friends, and something tragic happens and you're trapped in and you can't get out. Imagine what was going on in those people's minds that night. So first of all, I'm going to show you a clip. I believe this is a news clip about the disasters from the BBC. So I'll roll this first. Good evening. A massive fire at an American nightclub packed with young music fans has left at least 85 people dead. The blaze started during a rock concert when stage fireworks, used as part of the act, set the ceiling on fire. It took just minutes for the flames to rip through the building, leaving the people inside little time to escape. 160 people are injured, some critically. The fire broke out late last night in a nightclub known as The Station in West Warwick, Rhode Island. The club was a small, single-storey wooden building. It had no sprinkler system and didn't have a licence for pyrotechnics or firework displays. Our correspondent Matt Fry is in Rhode Island. Fiona, it's been a week of terrible statistics. Only on Monday, 21 people died in a stampede in a nightclub in Chicago. That was bad, but what happened here was much worse. 96 dead at the latest count. 96 and 25 people still in a critical condition. 
This is what happened only a few yards behind me exactly 18 hours ago. This was a tragedy caught on film from the very beginning. The band had just started playing. Ironically, the man taking these pictures was shooting a video about safety at pop venues. Then the pyrotechnics ignite the ceiling. The cameraman is already backing away, but most of the audience still think that they're witnessing a stunning display. Then panic. Only three minutes later, the club lit up like a torch. A death trap with most of the 300 fans stuck behind this door. Anybody inside? One can only imagine the fear behind the desperate scramble to escape the flames. This man was saved, but the intense heat made him steam in the cold winter air. People are running out on fire. <laughs> it's pretty much, pretty probably the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. We have no idea where some of our friends are still. The fire crews arrived within minutes, but this was all that was left standing of the small building made of wood. Early morning revealed the blackened crater, the cars of the dead still standing where they had been parked. Amongst the grieving, the shocked, and the merely curious, the band's lead singer. The next thing you know, you know, the, the whole place caught it. I mean, I don't know if somebody broke a window in front or something, but it just went like, boom, and then the lights went out. All security lights went out, there was pitch black. And everybody was screaming. And I mean, people were, there was people under me, and, and there was people on top of me, and... How'd you get out? Somebody pulled me, a, a man outside at the railing, he pulled me out. Midday, and the firemen were still recovering bodies, one every 15 minutes. We spoke to their chief. Have you personally ever seen anything as bad as this? Well, I was, um, somebody just asked me that. Uh, I spent a year in Vietnam and uh, saw bodies and so on, but not, uh, not to the point of uh, this much tragedy in one spot in such a short time. West Warwick is a small community. Most of the dead came from here. Young people whose fatal mistake was to listen to some music in the wrong place at the wrong time. Matt, there must be a lot of questions being asked there now about how this fire was able to start in the first place, how it was able to spread so quickly, and who's to blame? Well, good point, Fiona. I mean, first of all, I think we have to say that this has now become one of the worst fires in recent American history. And then, of course, there are those very many questions. The band, for instance, says that they got permission for this pyrotechnics display, which you saw in my film, was incredibly dangerous. It beggars belief how anyone could have given permission for that. The owner of the ill-fated nightclub says that he never gave the permission. The police, police are now saying that they will press for criminal charges. And of course, there are an awful lot of extremely angry and sad relatives in this small community who want answers to questions that they thought they would never have to ask. Matt, thanks very much indeed. All right, as you can see from that BBC clip, it was horrendous. And at the time of that, they had only counted 96 dead. But as we all know, when it's all said and done, it was over 100 people who lost their lives in that fire. Some of smoke inhalation, some of being directly burned, some trampled because some people was trying to fight to get out the exit. And of course, you know, when that happens, everyone's rushing to the exit. It causes a bottleneck effect. And some people fell to the ground, to the floor, and some of those people were trampled. Just like what happened in Chicago. All right, now here's another short piece that someone put together about that. It's this little short documentary piece, about seven or so minutes, and then I'll get back with you after that, and then we're going to actually roll into the footage of what happened that night. At 11.07 p.m. on the 20th of February 2003, at the Station Nightclub in West Warwick, Rhode Island, pyrotechnics used as part of a concert by the hard rock band Great White set fire to acoustic foam surrounding the stage. The flames spread with incredible speed. As patrons rushed to escape, exits became jammed. 
All in all, 100 people lost their lives, and hundreds more were injured and traumatized, all in the space of just a few short minutes. The fire started just seconds into the band's opening song. Pyrotechnics designed to create a controlled shower of sparks had been set up on either side of the stage. Two fountains were directed straight up, and two were angled off at 45 degrees. As Great White took to the stage and launched into their song, Desert Moon, tour manager Daniel Bichel triggered these pyrotechnics. It was the angled fountains that were principally responsible for igniting the acoustic foam which surrounded the stage. Video of the incident shows the fire taking hold, reaching the ceiling in a matter of seconds. Patrons were initially slow to evacuate. This may have been because they believed that the fire was part of the act. The music video for the song, which the band were playing, showed the musicians surrounded by flames. Not long after the pyrotechnics ended, though, the band ceased to play, and the lead vocalist, Jack Russell, calmly spoke into the microphone while looking at the blaze. That's not good, he said. The band members fled the nightclub via an exit beside the stage. Realising the danger they were in, the crowd began to evacuate as well. The station nightclub had several exits, but most patrons were unfamiliar with the layout of the building, and so flocked towards the main entrance and exit. The narrow corridor leading up to this door was swiftly jammed with bodies. 462 people were in the building when the fire began. 58 more than the venue's official capacity. In the chaotic rush to escape, many people were trampled. The main exit became clogged completely with bodies, with patrons wedged in so tight that even those who had already escaped couldn't pull them free. In addition to the deaths caused by crushing and trampling, many also died from smoke inhalation. The acoustic foam gave off a dense, opaque, toxic smoke when it burned, which not only made it extremely difficult to navigate the building, but also caused death after just a few breaths. In total, 100 people died on scene as a result of crush-related injuries, smoke inhalation, and from burns from the fire itself. Among the dead were Ty Longley, the lead guitarist of Great White. It is reported that he initially escaped unscathed, but, miscalculating the severity of the fire, returned to the building to try and rescue his guitar. Ty Longley was the only member of the band to perish in the fire. The other members of Great White escaped through a door adjacent to the stage, a door which at least some audience members were prevented from using by a bouncer who stated adamantly that the exit was for the band only. With so many dead and the nightclub destroyed, thoughts turned to who to blame for the disaster. The nightclub owners said they did not give permission for the band to use pyrotechnics. Band members claimed they did have permission. Meanwhile, an investigation revealed that fire safety inspectors should long ago have demanded the installation of a sprinkler system into the ancient building. The two brothers who owned the nightclub and Great White's manager were charged with 200 counts of manslaughter each, two for each victim, as it was alleged that they had committed both criminal negligence manslaughter and misdemeanor manslaughter. While the nightclub owners pleaded not guilty, Great White's manager, Daniel Bichel, pled guilty, stating that he wished the investigation to be over quickly so that the families of the victims could achieve closure. Bichel was sentenced to four years in prison, with an additional suspended sentence. Many of the families of the deceased were supportive of him, with some even writing letters that noted their forgiveness and asking for him to be freed from prison. He was released after serving just two years in jail. The two nightclub owners were given similar sentences, with one of them facing four years in jail and the other three years of probation. The difference in their sentences was down to the different levels of responsibility they each had for the purchase and installation of the flammable foam. Numerous civil suits worked their way slowly through the courts, with the largest resulting in a settlement of $25 million from a company that manufactured the foam. Five months after the fire, Great White went on a benefit tour. They began each set with a prayer for those who had lost their lives in the fire, 
and donated a portion of their proceeds to a fund to support the surviving relatives. For many years, they refused to play the song they had been playing when the fire began, but eventually added it to their repertoire again in 2009. The site of the fire was cleared, and survivors and loved ones of the deceased left numerous crosses as memorials to the dead. A permanent memorial was eventually erected on the site, and it is now a park which sees a memorial service on the 20th of February each year. While the fire was a terrible and costly one, it did result in an almost instant improvement in fire safety across the board. A moratorium was placed on the use of pyrotechnics in small venues, and many nightclubs undertook programs of rapid improvement to bring their premises up to code. While the 100 music lovers who died during the station nightclub fire might have died unnecessarily, their deaths, at least, were not in vain. Okay, shouts out to a Fascinating Horror for that clip. I'll post a link to that clip down below. And as you can see, this was a serious event. Now, one thing you don't do is run back in the house or the building or whatever is on fire. You don't run back in it. Once you escape, you don't run back in. And it's sad to say that that guitarist lost his life to go and retrieve his guitar, a piece of material item that could be replaced, but his life couldn't be. So most definitely rest in peace to him and my condolences goes out to his family. Now, the footage that you saw in both of those clips were from the upcoming footage I'm going to play now. This is the actual footage in its entirety of the events that took place that night. Everything from, you'll see where people are mingling, having a good time, just, you know, just kicking it, settling in to the, you know, for the night, getting ready to enjoy themselves. And you can even hear uh, an opening band playing in the background. And then you see where Great White takes the stage and things go left from there. So I'm gonna say this, this is a warning. This is a warning for anyone that's out there watching this. There's a piece in this that's going to trip you out. But you're going to see the moment when everything started on the way to when the building was damn near no more. It's over an hour. I won't interject. I won't pause. I'll let this whole clip play in its entirety and again this is a warning viewer discretion is, is advised um, this is only for adults eyes only I want to make sure I put this out there and this is also for fair use this is education purposes and for discussion and when this is all said and done I'll come back with a little cap off it won't be long and drawn out and then we'll wrap it up but this is the actual footage from the Station Nightclub fire, February 20th, 2003. This footage comes from the local news cameraman who was in there filming because they were going to do a piece on club safety and the irony in that. All right. So here it is in its entirety. You've been warned.
There's got to be 50 people still left inside that thing dead. This is not good. I'm out of there. I'm out. I'm out in the parking lot. The fire department's here already. I mean, what happened happened. I see.
dressing room. You know. Right next to the freaking
Hey, Bobby. What's up? 
Oh, I'm gonna broadcast it live. Pull up, huh?
Okay, you just got through watching that video in its entirety. The station nightclub fire occurred on the evening of February 20th, 2003 in West Warwick, Rhode Island, killing 100 people and injuring 230. The fire was caused by pyrotechnics set off by the tour manager of the evening's headlining band, Great White which ignited flammable acoustic foam in the walls and ceilings surrounding the stage. It reached flashover within one minute, causing all combustible, combustible materials to burn. Intense black smoke engulfed the club within two minutes. Video footage, as we just got through seeing, of the fire shows its, shows its ignition, rapid growth, the billowing smoke that quickly made escape impossible and blocked egress that further hindered evacuation. The toxic smoke, heat, and the resulting human rushing, all the human people rushing to the door, the main exit killed 100 people. Let me read that back again. The toxic smoke, heat, and the resulting human rush toward the main exit killed 100 people. 230 were injured and another 132 escaped uninjured. Many of the survivors developed post-traumatic stress disorder after the event. The fire was the fourth deadliest at a nightclub in U.S. history and the second deadliest in the New England area, behind the 1942 Coconut Grove Fire, which resulted in 492 deaths. I just got through watching something about that one here recently. But it was this one that really intrigued me, because this happened during my lifetime. I remember turning on CNN the night this was on, that this happened, and I just happened to catch it right when the story started. And ever since then, it's been like an a lingering thing in the back of my conscience. How could something that tragic happen so fast? The people who were up front trying to get a good view of the, of the band, those were some of the people who didn't make it out because when they had to turn around and get back out, now they're the last people. Now they're in the back. The people who were way in the back who thought they couldn't get a good view, well, when that fire started, when they turned around, they were the first ones to be out. I want to say this right quick and then I'm, I'm going to wrap it up. We have to start being aware of how to do our jobs with integrity. I had a discussion with this about this with my girl here recently about how some people can have something happen to them, like a death in their family, uh, a, a relationship they were in kind of just traumatically ended. Something could happen to some people. And some of these people work in places that manufacture airplanes, cars, all kinds of stuff, right? So let's just say Joe Schmo had his heart broken from a, a, a girl he loved for the last two, three years. And she just abruptly broke it off with him. Depending on how Joe Schmo takes that breakup, he's either going to like, you know, deal with the sting of it and then move on, or he's going to let it hang over him and he'll never get over that, at least for a long time. Now, he may work at a car manufacturer, right? And he may work in the part where this important nut and screw combination has to go on. This, this, I mean, all parts must go on, but this is the part where he's in a department where these parts are critical. Now, he's coming to work with a broken heart, can't focus, and he's half-assed doing his job. Don't even feel like doing his job. He showed up because maybe he just wanted to show up for work and didn't want to call out. But at the same time, he's not in the working mode. He's not thinking right. So he's half-assed screwing this nut and bolt combination on throughout the course of the day. And now that line of cars that he put his parts on are now tainted. Fast forward six months to a year, one of those cars have an accident on the road, hurt someone or, tr or, or tragically kills someone. 
Now, that line of cars are being recalled or that batch of cars are being recalled all because Joe Schmo didn't do his damn job well that day because he had a broken heart. Now, I said all that to say this. That band's tour manager should have assessed the situation very well before he set that off. Now they're saying that, well, not now, but in the heat of the moment, the club owners were saying that they didn't give permission to use the pyrotechnics, and the bands are saying that the club owners gave them permission to use the pyrotechnics. So now you got that in the mix. Do you think the families of the victims want to see or hear that? They want answers. If you can, if you if you watch that video in its entirety, it is horrific. There's a part where someone, there's a part where the fire like really got really intense, and someone was standing close to the building, and that person caught fire. That person was running and caught because they caught fire. I seen that watching this clip. The screams inside the building all of a sudden got quiet. Can you imagine being outside of that club wondering if one of your friends that you came to the club with was inside and they didn't make it out? This one guy said he was trying to help pull some of the people who were stuck in the entrance, trying to help pull this one guy out. He said the heat from the fire was so intense that when he went to grab his arms to pull them out, his skin slid like sleeves. It just slid down. Can you imagine seeing that shit? Can you imagine what the fire and rescue teams saw after that? All the bodies that were charred. Parking lot full of cars. Of people who were victims who didn't make it out. And as that story said, a lot of those victims who survived, uh, the band members, and a lot of the first responders still to this day in 2022 suffer PTSD from that incident. That changed everything. People have start, got to start doing their jobs with more integrity. That was something that could have been prevented. That didn't have to happen. The lead singer, Jack Russell, he still deals with that every now and then. All right. You got one batch of people that say, hey, man, I understand. I know it was an accident. I know it was. I I, I feel you. Then you have another batch of people that say, hey, you guys killed 100 people. You all didn't get permission. You all didn't assess the room properly to to say if you want to use those or not. That's what they still live with to this day. The guy right here in the bottom right with the shades on, he was the most burned. He was, out of all the survivors, he caught the worst. Over 45% of his body was burned. He lost his left eye. He lost his fingers. He lost his ears, his hair. He's still alive, but now he's a totally different person. That didn't have to happen. I'm not pointing the blame at Great White. I'm not pointing the blame because I don't know who to blame. I do know that Great White and the club owners do are taking full responsibility for it, and they should as well. They should do. They should take responsibility for it. But this did not have to happen. This story still kind of haunts me. I wasn't there. I don't know anyone who was involved. I don't know any of the victims. I don't know any of the band members. All I know is that this story kind of haunted me because I'm in the music industry. And there's plenty of times where I'm out in a setting where one of my acts are going to be performing. But some of the other acts are on before we go on. And so I'm out right up front. I'm right up front. And the places be packed a lot of times. That really changed my algorithm, so to say, of when I'm out promoting music with my ex you want to be able to know where the exits are and if you can't play the exit all night even though you may be way in the back you may not get a good view it just so happened when something jumps off you'll be one of the first people if not the first one out the door 
you'll be able to live to tell the story. There was over 230 people who were injured. And over 100 people, 100 people were killed from either directly being burned to death, from being stomped in the stampede of people trying to rush out, or just from flat out smoke inhalation from the um, from the stuff that caught from the materials that caught fire. All right. The uh, the soundproofing that they had in there set off some type of chemical and that was deadly. So my condolences goes out to the friends, family and loved ones of this tragic event. My heart goes out to all those who do, who did survive and make it out of there alive, who can tell the story, who probably don't even want to relive that. My heart goes out to the band members because they lost a band member that night. They lost their lead guitarist in that. Now, granted, you don't go back in a fire. When you escape a fire of that magnitude, you actually got out, you live, you, you're alive. Fuck going back in and grab a material object. It was said that he went back in to go grab his guitar. That doomed him. He underestimated that fire. That fire, if you, watching that video, that fire took, it took place, I mean, it happened so fast. Literally, it happened that fast. People, enjoy yourselves while you're out there, but also be aware of your surroundings. Be aware of the exits, just in case you need to be one of the first few or the first one out the door. Fire, fighting, gunshots, whatever it is, please be vigilant and aware of your surroundings. All the club promoters, road managers, roadies, bands that have pyrotechnic as part of your your stage performance. Let this be a lesson. That didn't have to happen. It's almost 20 years old. It's old news, I know. But it's coming up on the next year will mark 20 years that this happened. I don't like using that word anniversary. I don't celebrate death. So I don't be like, well, Mark, next year will mark the 20th anniversary of this tragic event. I don't celebrate death because when I hear anniversary, I'm thinking celebration, a joyous occasion. I don't celebrate death. So I just say next year will mark 20 years that this tragic event happened. That's how I do it. There's going to be some people who watch this and going to have nightmares. I'm not trying to bring that on to you. I'm just trying to show you and educate you what can happen when you're in these situations. <coughs> when people, excuse me, <coughs> when people don't do their job correctly. This is all this is about. <clears throat> people doing their job with integrity, no matter what you're going through. Shortcuts, which is what this is, was, which was a shortcut. The owners are saying that they, did, they didn't give permission. And the band is saying that they did get permission. Who is lying? Who is telling the truth? We don't know. It's almost 20 years after the fact. But if someone was correct, that wouldn't have happened. This young man right here in the bottom right with the shades on, he has to live like that for the rest of his life. The band on the left, they have to live with that stigma. That something that they did caused 100 people to die. And one of the most horrific ways to die. That's the reason why death is so scary. Because there's too many ways to die. Fire, gunshot, natural causes, car wreck, freak accident. It's too many ways to die. And 100 people die in the same way in one night. All together. Picture that shit. That's what that band Great White, Jack Russell and Great White, they have to live with that stigma. Again, I said earlier, you have that bat, that batch of people that will see them and be like, hey, man, I understand. 
I know it wasn't. T- I, I understand that you have that other batch of people that look that will look at them and say, you guys killed 100 people. You guys had a, a, a band roadie or band manager who did his job negligently. And because of that, 100 people die and 230 people are injured and another 130 people escaped with their lives. Imagine being in that parking lot seeing all those cars of the victims who didn't make it out. As you can see early on in the video, everything looked like it was going to be a great night. People were laughing, having a good time. The music was good. The lighting was great. Everyone had that, hey, Great White is here. We about to rock out because Great White is a great group. They were there to see their favorite band. Wow, the world is scary, man. Things can happen in a split second. Just like that. That was literally in seconds, man. They weren't even into the first one whole minute of their song before all that happened. You heard what Jack Russell said. Oh, this isn't good. You can see the band members jumping off the stage. You had that goofy-ass bodyguard or that bouncer that was guarding that one door that was for the band but damn it this is an emergency fuck that let everyone out I wonder where he's at right now where is that bouncer right now who blocked the door initially wouldn't let people out talking about some this exit is strictly for the band when there's a fire that exit is strictly for everyone trying to get out with their life homie I'm surprised he didn't get like civilly sued Again, I didn't want to bring any traumatic stuff to you. I wanted to share something with you. This is something that's been really in the back of my mind ever since it happened. And I wanted to say something about it. I wanted to say something about it. And I'm glad that I did. So, I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, there will be links to these videos below. You can go ahead on, do further research, look more into it. I believe there's a documentary that came out in 2018 called The Guest List uh, about this horrific event. And mark my word, I'm predicting this. You heard Dollar Bill Skull say this. I believe they're going to be making a movie about this. It's already going on 20 years after the event. I believe that's going to give them clearance and red light. I mean, green light to say, okay, 20 years plus is enough. We can go ahead, get the rights to the story and make a feature film about it. I predicted this. I believe that's coming next. Again, my condolences goes out to the friends, family, loved ones, to all the victims who lost their lives that night. My heart goes out to all those who did survive but got out with tragic injuries like that guy right here on the bottom right. And most definitely, my heart goes out to a great white, the band. They didn't know that that night that their set was going to kill 100 people. They didn't know that. Again, this is Dollar Bilsko. As I always say, it's FBA versus everybody, and we must protect and preserve the culture. Peace.